What's up, my chemistry students? Today we are talking about calorimetry. So we're using that information we learned about specific heat calculations and apply it to actually determining the specific heat in a laboratory setting. All right, so here are the parts of the calorimeter. Okay, and you need to know these parts. You'll have to be able to label them on a quiz and you'll need to be able to identify them on a test. And so before we label the parts, let's say what they measure. Calorie meters, or what we say calorimeters, measure heat, which is just Q. Um, it measures that indirectly because really what we're doing when we're using the calorimeter is we're doing a calculation. Um, we're using a thermometer to give us information, but we have to calculate it first. So what does the thermometer do? Well, it measures temperature. So it measures the change in temperature because we take the final temperature and the initial temperature of the water that is inside the calorimeter. Uh, we use two styrofoam cups. We do that so that there is minimal heat transfer to and from the outside. So styrofoam is a great insulator. That's why we use it. It resists uh, the movement of energy. All right, And then we have water inside of the calorimeter. The water acts as the surroundings to whatever sample we're looking at. Um, before we do anything with a calorimeter, we have to make sure we know the mass of the water inside the calorimeter because we're going to do a calculation with that mass. Um, we need to know the specific heat of water. That's 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. Okay, so what will happen here is we'll take a sample and we'll either heat it and see the heat change that it gives to the water, or we might have a sample that either dissolves in water and gives its energy to the water in some way. So it's either giving energy to the water or it's removing energy from the water. Okay. All right, so the key here is that calorimetry depends on the first law of thermodynamics, which is the law of conservation of energy, which means that the heat lost is equal to the heat gained. The heat that's being lost is by the sample, and it's being gained by the water. Or it could be the opposite. The heat could be gained by the sample, and it's coming from the water. But there is a heat transfer, okay? It's not being created, it's not being destroyed, it's being transferred from the sample to the water or the other way. So we would write this. We'd say that the Q of water is equal to the opposite sign for the sample, negative Q of sample. The sample is the system that we're interested in, and the water acts as the surroundings. This means that if the water experiences a negative change in energy, a negative Q, then the sample is going to be positive. Or if it's a positive change in Q, then the sample is going to be negative. We're always just going to change the sign as we go from water to sample. All right, the final temperature of the water inside the calorimeter is the same as the final temperature of the sample. Okay, so why do we need to know this? Um, because we're going to put something inside the calorimeter and those molecules are going to be moving around and bumping into each other. That includes the water molecules and the sample molecules. And so eventually they'll reach what we say is an equilibrium where those molecules are moving at the same speed and have the same temperature. So we'll need that piece of information later. But you need to know this, that the final temperature of the water surroundings is going to equal the final temperature of the sample, the system. All right, so here's our first calculation. It's very similar to what we had before when we were looking at um, specific heat. So it says, calculating energy using a calorimeter, sample one. A small amount of salt is added to 50 grams of water in a styrofoam calorimeter. The temperature of water changes from an initial temperature of 25.0 degrees Celsius to 32.0 degrees Celsius. Calculate the heat released by dissolving, by the dissolving of this salt. 
All right, so we're going to split it up into information that's given for the water and information that's given for the sample. Okay. It's going to seem weird at first. Okay, and the, the difference here is we're actually looking for the energy released by the salt. Okay. So the information I have is for water. So I don't know Q, so that'll still be a question mark. I know the mass of the water, which is 50 grams. I know the specific heat of water. It's always 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius, and I need that for all of my calorimeter calculations. Um, the temperature change is 32 minus 25, which is a change in 7 degrees Celsius. All right, so that's QMC delta T for water. Okay, for sample, I don't know its energy either. I want to know the heat of the sample. All right, so to do that, I have to find the heat for the water first. So I plug everything in to Q equals MC delta T, and I cancel out units, and I find that the Q is 1,464.4 joules. This is... 1500 with significant figures. It is not the energy of the sample. This information, this was the mass of the water. This was the specific heat of water. This was the temperature change of water. So all of this is information for water. This is how much energy the water, in this case, because it's positive, the water gained this amount of energy. Okay. So we're going to change that now to the energy that is um, given off by the sample. So we'll change the sign. And we have to write this. We have to say that the Q of water is equal to the negative Q of the sample. This is our law of conservation of energy here. This is the transfer of energy from the water to the sample. Okay, and so since um, that's a change in sign, since water had 1500 joules, uh, then the sample would be negative 1500 joules. That means that the salt released that much energy. That dissolving the salt is exothermic. All right, example two. We're now going to find the specific heat of a metal using a calorimeter, and you'll do this in lab two. Uh, it says we have a 50 gram piece of metal and it's heated from heated to 115 degrees Celsius. It's placed in a calorimeter that has 125 grams of water. Its initial temperature is 25.6 degrees Celsius. Then it says both the water and the metal have a final temperature of 29.3 degrees Celsius. Now, this question tells you that both the water and the metal have a final temperature. That's not always the case. Sometimes it'll just tell you the final temperature of the water, but you need to know that the final temperatures are always the same because they reach thermal equilibrium. All right, so then it says, what is the specific heat of the metal? So Q is unknown. We don't know the Q for water. We know the mass of water. It's 125 grams of water. Sometimes it's given as milliliters of water, and you can convert that to grams of water using the density of water. Specific heat we know, delta T is 3.7 degrees Celsius. So we have everything for water except for Q. Let's look at our information for the metal. So we don't have Q. We have the mass of the metal. Very important that you split it up between the water and the metal. Uh, we do not know the specific heat. In fact, that is what we're trying to find. The temperature change for the metal is negative, so it drops in temperature. So if you'll notice here, we have one unknown for the water. We have two unknowns for the metal. That's because once we find the unknown Q for the water, that's going to go to the Q for the metal, and then we'll only have one unknown for the metal. So let's do that here in three steps. All right, so first step, calculate the heat that's gained by water. So solve for Q for water. 
And so when I do that, um, I plug everything in. The 125 times 4.184 times the temperature change of 3.7. The units that cancel are grams and Celsius, so I'm left with joules. I round that to two significant figures because of the temperature change. Second step is to state the law of conservation of energy. That this energy was gained by the water, but it was lost by the metal. So I say negative, or excuse me, Q of the water is equal to negative Q of the metal. So we need to state that part. Well, Q water equals negative Q metal. And then show that it's negative 1900 joules. Do not just write negative 1900 joules. I want you to show this step that Q water equals negative Q metal. You don't just uh, get it from anywhere. You've got to show that. And then the last step is to, de to determine the specific heat for the metal. So we're going to rearrange Q equals MC delta T to solve for C. Plug everything in. I'm using the negative 1900, the mass of the metal this time. Be careful you're not reusing the information for the water. This is for the metal. And then the temperature change for the metal. Okay, notice I have two negatives here, um, which will end up canceling and give me a positive value for specific heat, which is good because specific heat is a positive value. So my specific heat is 0.44 joules per gram degree Celsius. Now, the question could go even further and ask you to identify this metal. If I had to identify this metal, I could say that this is closest to the specific heat of iron, which is 0.45 joules per gram degree Celsius. All right, we will do some of these in classroom.